Um, good evening. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, good, good evening. Um, uh, I'm, J I'm Jerry Clima, and I'm really happy that you're here. Um, uh, this is a presentation uh, that I'm doing with the Historical Society. I'm a member of the Histor Salisbury Historical Society, and uh, there's an, Salisbury has amazing history uh, from the colonial times, uh, you know, all the way to the present. Uh, there's just so much rich history in, in Salisbury that um, uh, you just can't, I kind of can't get enough of it. <laughs> but you're going to get a little bit of a dose of it tonight. Um, and um, it, and this this uh, this slideshow I worked on um, largely with Steve Atherton, who is was born in born in Salisbury, now lives on Plum Island, but uh, uh, is um, you know a, a good friend and really good with um, pictures and slides. So he's been you know we've worked together on get, gathering these things and um, and also um, he's made them look good. And I will talk about them. So <laughs> we have a good partnership. Um, the uh, this 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 show is um, really about hum the human development of Salisbury Beach uh, from uh, the earliest things that I have are from 1826 up until 1916. Um, uh, you know, there aren't many pictures from the really earliest periods. The earliest pictures I have are probably from around 1850, 1860. But I have some maps from the earlier period to kind of show what was going on. Um, and then it, it comes up uh, into the, um, the steamboat era, uh, the uh, horse railroads, trolleys um, that are driven by steam and then by electric. And eventually the automobile shows up so it's a lot of that really changes in the way people got around and got to the beach um, as well. And so that's part of what we'll see. Uh, and then the rest is uh, really what people did on the beach and, uh, and how, it, how they changed it and how it changed over the years. Um, there's one very important name that I'm going to probably mention too many times that, uh, you know, really who seems to be forgotten. And his name was Edward Shaw. How many people have heard of Edward Shaw? Ah, there's one. I told him. <laughs> oh, there's another one. Okay. House see, is still standing. He, and his house, and you'll see his house. But anyway, uh, he was a he is he he was the entrepreneur who really really took Salisbury Beach from the 19th century into the 20th century, um, and and you'll you'll see a lot about that. So, um, without any further ado. This is Salisbury's icon, you know, Ben Butler's toothpick, um, as, it, as, it, as it shows today uh, at Black Rocks. And it's sort of a symbol of uh, Salisbury Beach, at least when anyone is coming from the sea. And it has been for many years. Um, and here we have pretty much what we have today. If you look really closely, you can see that there have been some significant developments since 2005. But when, when, you know, when we think of Salisbury Beach today, you think of the southern end as being really just mostly a park. Uh, and as you, when we go back in history, you'll see that this was actually uh, the, the area that really developed first uh, and is now, you know, over time has changed into something else. Um, but um, this, it's, kind of, it's, it's interesting to kind of see what we have today and then go back in time and, uh, and uh, go uh, come into the future. Just to orient you a little bit, uh, this is called Black Rock Creek. This was an important waterway. We don't think of it as important anymore, but it was at one time. And of course, you have the, uh, the Merrimack River and the jetties, and then the beach all the way up, up there. Um, and if you look up in here, you can see Beach Road coming across and coming to, uh, to, the, to the center. Um, now, this is, this is a map that was done in 1826. Uh, the U.S. Uh, topographical engineer sent a, a sea captain up here to, to, uh, to find out what was going wrong with all the erosion they were having on Plum Island <laughs> in 1826. Uh, and uh, he drew a, a, a wonderful map that doesn't, it features mostly the mouth of the Merrimack because that's what he was interested in. But from the Salisbury perspective, what you can see is 
um, a little settlement at Rings Island uh, in a roadway. This is Ferry Road going up here. Salisbury Beach, at least at this end, has absolutely nothing on it. Um, it's just sand. And that's true, the whole beach is sand. At this time, uh, the beach was owned by the Salisbury commoners who were descendants of the original settlers. When the settlers first came here, the, uh, there was a group of, uh, I think, about 80 people who owned all of the land in common. They owned it together. And they could act to sell it to somebody or lease it or do whatever they wanted, but they owned all the land. And until they sold it or granted it to somebody, they still owned it in common. And what happened, of course, over the most of the years, they granted land to people uh, over the whole town, but they never granted any land on Salisbury Beach. So that was still owned in common at that time. Uh, and they used it for grazing, and they would cut, cut some wood. Um, eventually, um, uh, they would, uh, uh, for a fee, they would let sea captains come up and load ships with sand and take the sand away to uh, Boston and Salem to help build, build those cities. So basically, Plum Island and Salisbury Beach were, were sand mines uh, for a long time in, in, the, in this early period. But, uh, uh, and you can see how developed Newburyport is at that time. You know, there's a, there's a lot of wharves there. It's a real city. But Salisbury Beach has absolutely nothing on it. Um, now, this is a few, a few years later. Uh, it's, in a, it's, a, it's a chart for mariners. It comes from a, the, something called the American Coast Pilot. Uh, this is a book that, that would have the entrances to all the harbors in it. And this is the Newbury Port Harbor, which is, of course, Salisbury Beach, shown here, uh, and the mouth of the river, and how you get in if you're, if you're a sea captain. What's sort of interesting about this is that you can see the tremendous sandbars that, that that blocked the river. This made it very difficult to come into, into the harbor. Uh, in, uh, and in order, in order to help Nip Mariners come in, they had two lights on Plum Island. And they would be able to move them because the channel kept shifting. Um, and, and they would then be lined up. And you can see that ship is lined up on those lights. Go to the two lights, line them up, then turn, go in, and go on up into the harbor. Uh, an interesting thing that it shows on here, which you can't really see, it says um, piers in the middle of the river. And I couldn't, for a long time, I couldn't figure out what was going on there. But they show, you know, piers, which are things that people have made in the middle of the river. And what it turned out was that those were um, fortifications that were made in, first in the Revolutionary War, uh, because they, they, what happened was, they were afraid that the British would come in and then shell, you know, uh, uh, you know bombard Newburyport. So they decided to build um, a blockade at the mouth of the river. And uh, what happened was that the women of Salisbury went down to the beach, and there was a big grove of pine trees at this point, and they cut them all down. The women cut all the trees down, and then they, then the men built stone piers and used the trees to make a crib to hold the stones uh, in the river. And then they had the bigger logs were chained together and they could completely close the mouth of the river uh, if a ship was coming. They also had, they had um, and, and that was done again in the War of 1812, and they had forts on both Plum Island and Salisbury Beach uh, to, to defend the harbor against the British. Um, and those piers, I said, as I said, were rebuilt in the War of 1812, and they're still there in 1839. Uh, but that's an interesting little bit of, of history. Um, one other thing that's kind of fun, look, notice um, there's something here that says salt works. There was a big salt manufacturing uh, place on Marl Creek, which is at the end of Sweet Apple Tree Lane. I've got a, uh, an engraving of it. They, they had eight or 10 buildings and they dammed up the creek, and they would flood areas of the marsh and evaporate it, and then took it off. So there was a, for about um, 60, 70 years, they were making salt right at the river bank there in Salisbury. Um, what's also a little bit interesting here is that, as you see, Salisbury Beach still has nothing on it. Plum Island, 
uh, there was a turnpike was built, a privately built turnpike was built in 1807, and they had a hotel out there uh, that early. There was much more activity there with the lighthouses and the hotel. The hotel was primarily for hunters because this was tremendous uh, hunting territory. Um, and now we're coming up to 1851. Um, one interest, in, this again begins to show, I'll go a little close, closer, but you can see here now there's a bridge across the river, a railroad has come in. Uh, in fact, the railroad is, uh, the bridge was built in, in 1826 and the railroad came in 1840 and the railroad negotiated with the owners of the bridge, which is privately owned. This is very interesting that all of these public works are, that we think of public works were private works and people owned them and invested in them and built them. The turnpike was private too. And then, the, but the private railroad made a deal with the owners of the bridge to build a second deck on top for trains. And so we have some pictures, which I won't show you here, showing trains going across this covered bridge uh, uh, and going, you know, going across the river on a, on a double deck. Sort of interesting. Um, this is a closer, a close up from that uh, map, which shows, this is the first thing that I can find that really shows uh, Salisbury Beach. This, um, here you can see a roadway going out to the center. That is what we today called Old County Road. Goes past the dump. And that was the original way to get to the beach by, by, uh, by foot. That road was laid out you know, in colonial times. They had a road to the beach very early. Uh, what's also interesting is that this says, this says Canal to Hampton. Um, there was a substantial canal uh, that was dug in uh, 1797 to connect Black Rock Creek, this, this windy little creek that you think of as being insignificant, right? Connected by a canal to um, the creeks to the north and into Hampton Harbor. And there's a very interesting story. In the War of 1812, an American privateer was being uh, pursued by a British warship and that was much bigger than he was. Privateer probably would have been in the 120, 140 foot range. And he was able to get away from the warship by coming in the mouth of the river, going in Black Rock Creek, and going through the canal and getting away in Hampton. Can you imagine a 140 foot vessel going through Beach Road? I mean, you know, that's, so things have changed a great deal uh, in that time. You can also see here, there's some paths that have now developed all the way down pretty much to the end here. Um, and this was an interesting thing. This, see this little place here, that path went very close to the creek. That's where the smugglers would come. They would come in the dark, go up here, and they could actually unload directly from the boat onto wagons. So this was a really good place to smuggle. Uh, this custom house, of course, was upriver. <laughs> And apparently that went on, you know, for many, many years. Um, so, uh, there's, but there's really still not very much here. Uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of a pier at, that, at the south end. Um, and Salisbury Beach is just starting to have things start to happen there. There's still no houses on the beach at all. No houses at all. No, no nothing. Ah, there's, this is actually the second hotel. And this was built at the point um, uh, it was called Our House, as you can tell. And if you're coming by sea, as you would, you could see it from a long way away. And that, that was your, what, were your what your destination was. Um, there had been, there, there, the, first, the first building at the beach was called the, the uh, Bluefish Chowder House. And it was built in the 1850s, but it was abandoned uh, after just a few years. And then someone else, someone built the Bay State Hotel and then this Our House was added uh, in 1860. So it was just beginning to start to, to um, have some people come and spend a little time at the beach, but only at the, only at the south end. Um, there's, there's more of the hotels at Black Rocks around 1860. See, pretty, pretty, pretty small. Oops, now we're into the Civil War. Can you imagine a fort this big on Salisbury Point? This was there. And look at the, look at the, uh, the big um, fortifications. Um, 
and it was, you know, it was a substantial fort. You can see a little roadway here, a plank road for, to come out to the point. There's a picture from inside the fort, 1863. Kind of a, kind of, you know, pretty substantial. Uh, by 1867, however, it all washed away. It was eroded and gone by 1867. So it shows you how rapidly. See, the, the river mouth was changed really rapidly because if a river isn't constrained by jetties or something man-made, it naturally wants to sort of, if you turn your garden hose on hard, right, what does it do? It goes back and forth. Well, a river does the same thing. And um, so, so, that, so the river mouth was always changing in, these, in this early time. Uh, which was a problem for navigation because the channel was always shifting and getting too shallow. Uh, but um, but this, this is a pretty significant activity there in the 1860s. And during that same time, uh, the town of Salisbury began to sponsor picnics uh, up at the center of the beach. Um, and they, they would have a picnic in mid-September and people would, uh, from Salisbury would gather and have a party, you know, at the harvest time. Um, and that started, I think, in the 1850s. I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, by 1860, um, they had um, uh, 3,000 people there uh, to the, at this. They could, and they began to be called Great Gatherings. That was the Salisbury's Great Gathering. By the end of the Civil War, it got very popular, and it drew 20,000 people and 1,000 carriages. And there they are. <laughs> and they came from as far away as Haverhill. You know, they, 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 the people just, just like today, people from up the river would come and, and have these, have a, have a, and they would camp out for a week and, uh, and uh, have a good time at the beach. They're not exactly dressed for the beach, <laughs> but I don't think people swam much then. I think they were there to get the air and, the, and to have a good time. And apparently the politicians were drawn like flies too, and they would all come and give speeches at length. <laughs> well, if you get 20,000 people in one place, that's a pretty good place for a politician to be. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, the fact that people were, were now thronging to the beach at various times, uh, you know, got the entrepreneurs going again. And rather than that crummy old county road, which would flood and be, you know, really not be a very accessible thing. A company was formed uh, called the Plank Road Company, and they built a toll road made of wood. And it's on the, it's basically was on the same track as Beach Road is today, and the old county road is to the north. And this is the toll house. And what's very interesting about this, this is not a picture, this is a painting. Uh, but it's not, it's not contemporary. This was done by a, uh, by a local Salisbury artist known, uh, named Glenn Fowler. Oh, yeah. uh, people probably remember him. Uh, and he was, he was um, and these, this, this is actually in Town Hall. That's where this painting came from, or that's where I, got, I took a picture of it. Uh, actually, Lance, took a, Lance Wisniewski took a picture of it. But uh, Glenn Fowler, was paralyzed at the, at the age of 18 in, a, in an automobile accident and from the neck down. He couldn't move his hands and he couldn't move his feet and he painted with a, with a, a paintbrush held in his teeth. So that was all done in that way and, we, and he painted from old pictures uh, that, he could, that he could get hold of in some way or another. And one of my missions on, while doing all this was to try to find some of the pictures that corresponded to his paintings. <coughs> Uh, another interesting part of this is that uh, Bill Fowler said that, you know, Glenn didn't have much money, but he had these paintings. And I think some, the reason the town hall has some of these is that they were, that they were given to the town in lieu of taxes. So, which is actually, you know, a very nice thing for everybody to see, that there, there's a number of them in town hall. Um, and they're, they're really wonderful, wonderful. Uh, you can't really read this, but this is a place you could drop your laundry. The plank road was, um, and, and they would take it away uh, and, and clean it and bring it back the next day. The plank road was built in 1866. So this great gathering of 20,000 people, you know, stimulated 
uh, the building of this road. Um, oh, and there's a, there's a picture of the, of, the, of the toll house and the toll, the, the toll taker, not a bad job. See, he's got a, he can, he can sit there. And what's interesting, this is the, um, this is the, the rate board that tells you how much it costs. And Steve was able to blow it up and it's pretty neat. First of all, the speed limit was six miles an hour um, and it cost 20 cents round trip for a horse and carriage. And um, if you wanted to bring your cattle or sheep over the road, you had to pay two cents. Uh, if you rode your horse, it was five cents. But you, they didn't want to ruin the road, so you had to get special permission for heavy loads. But it's a kind of, and here's the plank road in winter. Someone was shooting crows. But uh, what's interesting about this is this is that um, this is where it crossed that canal. So the, by the canal was built in 1797, but the railroads came in uh, 1840. And by the time, by, the, by 1866 and beyond, the canal pretty much was abandoned. It, it served its purpose. It wasn't, they didn't need it for transportation anymore, so it began to fill in. And it's not a very significant thing anymore at this point. This is looking back toward the mainland from the beach. But also, it's interesting, here's the telegraph wires. I have looked it up. The transcontinental telegraph was complete in 1861, so it's consistent that the Plank Road you know, at some point would have had a telegraph. So someone was communicating out to the beach at that time. Uh, this is a map of Salisbury from 1872. And I think it's particularly interesting because it names uh, lots of the people. You know, the, the names, here's the Marls at Marl Creek, uh, Garish's, lots of the Trues on True Road, lots of Pikes, Eaton's. You know, all the names, all the old names, and they're just sprinkled all over the map, um, which, is, which is very interesting. But now you can see in 1872, there's the Plank Road, straight as an arrow, and there's the old county road, still there. Uh, but the beach has begun to really change. Those are all buildings. Um, and the first, the first cottage was built on the beach in 1864. And you have to remember that um, that uh, the commoners owned the land. They didn't sell it. They leased it to people. So all of those houses were built on leased land. And yet, at the bottom here, you can see our house, that which you saw the picture of before. Um, but you know, it's getting to have a substantial little settlement right along the beachfront. Um, and, uh, but still nothing much. Uh, just, you know, a couple of hotels here that are accessible by boat, uh, not, not really very accessible by anything else. Uh, but you can see also, it's sort of interesting, now the railroad has built its own bridge. That was in the 1860s. And the uh, branch that, uh, of the, um, from Salisbury, actually, you know, Salisbury Mills is the center of downtown Amesbury today. At this time, Amesbury, uh, everything everything west of the Powwow River was still Salisbury and Salisbury Mills. So that was a Salisbury Railroad. It never did go into Amesbury until Amesbury took over part of Salisbury uh, in, in the 1870s. Um, so as more and more people wanted to go there, um, people began to come uh, to have dedicated river steamers that would carry people to the Black Rocks and to appear there. And this is, this is um, uh, Edward Shaw's uh, landing at Black Rocks uh, in 1880. And you can see there's a couple of steamboats. Now this is very interesting. You know, what in the world is going on here? It looks like a steamboat, right? But it's not a boat because it's got all these uh, pilings underneath it. Well, this is, this is, a, this is a quite, quite, and you can also see how many people have just unloaded. There are a lot of people, and they're filing in. This was a restaurant, uh, and Shaw put that there. And the story behind it is that there was a uh, Canadian-built steamer that had come down to the Merrimack. But 
because it was foreign built, it couldn't be licensed. And so it was basically useless. Uh, and Mr. Shaw, who was an entrepreneur, bought it. And since it, he couldn't use it either, so he took it apart and he put the superstructure up there and made it into a restaurant. And then he took the boilers and the paddle wheels and all the mechanical equipment and he built a new steamer called the City of Haverhill. <laughs> And so he, he got a kind of a two for one out of that. Uh, and you can see it's a, it looks like a Mississippi River boat. You see, it's a stern wheel steamer. Um, what's very interesting about that is that the statistics on it as a boat are really remarkable. It's 146 feet long and 18 feet from the water line to the top of the deck, 18 feet. And it drew only two feet of water. So you can imagine you can imagine how unstable it was, <laughs> right? Well, Shaw sold it to some people who wanted to use it in Key West. And they tried to take it to Key West, but they were lost at sea. They never made it. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, now here's, here's, here's Butler's toothpick as it appeared. That was built in the 1870s and as it appeared in 1882. And here, here are people uh, digging clams in their Sunday best. I think that's quite a picture when you think about it. <laughs> Go to the beach and dig clams in your coat and tie and hat. The whole family's there. <laughs> um, in any event, uh, I told you before about how, how treacherous the river was, and uh, ships were advised not to even try to come in the river in storms. It was just, you know, there were tumultuous breakers, really terrible. Um, but what was happening during this period is that, uh, you know, the mills had been built up the river in, in Haverhill and Lawrence and Lowell. And they originally were powered by water, but they rapidly outgrew the water power that they needed. That they, that they had available, and they converted the steam. Well, where do you get the steam? You get the steam from coal. And where do you get the coal? You get it from Pennsylvania and Nova Scotia. And how does it get here? Well, it gets here by boat, and it has to come into the Merrimack. Well, that's a problem when you're bringing big, heavy, coal-laden ships in a really treacherous harbor. So the coal merchants all banded together and they petitioned Congress to build jetties at the mouth of the Merrimack. And the purpose of building the jetties was to um, uh, concentrate the flow of the river and make it faster and stronger so it would cut through the bar. And the channel, normally the channel was only five to seven feet deep at, at low water. They wanted to try with the jetties to make it 17 feet deep and make it safe for their, for their ships to come in. Um, and Congress agreed, and they um, uh, sent engineers up to survey and, uh, and design, d design the jetties. And this is one of the first plans of the jetties. This is after they've begun to construct it. And it's, it's interesting because the, they built the North Jetty first. If you see on this map, you see these lines? This is erosion. This shows that the beach is moving backward very rapidly. That's, over, that's only three years' worth of erosion from 1880 to 1883. Uh, it's just about eating the whole point away. So what they realized was that as they were building this jetty, that it was actually focusing. If you had a southeast wind, it was focusing the waves and making, it, uh, making the point erode away. And on the other side, on Plum Island side, same thing, a northeaster was rapidly eating off the end of Plum Island. So they, they decided to change their design. These were going to come to 1,000 feet apart. And they decided to extend them by 1,000 feet there so that the waves couldn't sneak around them. They couldn't come through. So they, they were adapting you know, to these circumstances as they saw what, <coughs> what, what the jetty was. The jetty wasn't, was, was making a deeper channel, but it was also destroying the ends of, of both Salisbury Point and uh, Plum Island Point. So they, they changed their plan. It's also very interesting to see at the construction. This is a contractor's railroad 
Um, Mr. Shaw, what got the contract to build the jetties? He had, was not in that business before. He had actually started out as a stagecoach driver. He was the youngest stagecoach driver ever licensed in Massachusetts. He's from Newburyport. He, he was driving stages to Boston at age 18. And he had a very successful stagecoach company. But of course, when the railroads, and he's competed with the railroad effectively until the 1870s, which is amazing. But with the railroads and the steamers and you know, all this technology changing, um, he got out of the uh, Shaw's Express business and got into other things. And in this thing, he got the contract for the jetties. He bought land up by Cars Island and developed a quarry and built a good part of the, uh, you know, the, the, first, the first part of the jetties and had a railroad to take the stone out both on both, on both Salisbury uh, and Plum Island Point. Um, this is interesting. This is the 1812 fort. That still was there at that time, whereas the Civil War fort had been out here and it was eroded long, long since. Um, and this is another interesting thing that appears for the first time. This is the Seaside Railroad. Uh, as the steamers began to come um, to the, um, the point, they had a problem to tra the, and, the, and you saw the development was up to the north, so they had to get people up there. Well, uh, there was a man named um, Enoch Northend who, who, was, who was operating a horse railroad in Newburyport and Amesbury, and he built the Seaside Railroad, and that was, uh, they had horses pulling um, cars with loads of people on them, and just between the point and the center. Um, and so that was, that was another guy named North End. Uh, here's, a, here's a steam engine uh, pulling cars full of uh, rocks and building the jetties. Um, and they would also bring jetty, they would bring the rocks down from the quarry on, um, on barges and then uh, dump them in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the river to, to start the, to start the, uh, you know, to begin to build up the jetty from, 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 from the bottom. But this is just an interesting thing. How do you get the rocks off this thing? You know, and you can imagine they had cranes to drop, put the rocks on, you know, but then how do they get them off? There's no crane on that. Well, somebody, and I can't remember the name now, uh, got a patent on what they called a self-dumping scow. <laughs> and what he did was he built a, a barge with a, with a table on top, and the table had uneven legs with wheels on them that were ran on tracks. So the table was flat, but the tracks were sloped. And they would load that table up with rocks at the quarry, take it here, and when that operator, you see the man standing up there, he's holding on to a, to a lever. Uh, he would let it go. The table would slide out over the edge of the barge, counterbalance it, make it go like this. The rocks would fall in the water. And of course, then the barge would recoil, you can imagine. And he had the job of catching it on the way back. And they said that a good operator could do it almost all the time. <laughs> but if he didn't, they had a winch. They could winch it back if they had to. But you can see these people here are holding the barge in place, that, you know, by, by, with, with um, dories, um, you know, just, just trying to hold it right in place. It, it, it's all, all manpower. Ah, but then they became a tourist attraction. And so this is, this is a period postcard. Kind of, can you imagine walking on the beach? Just like that. <laughs> I really like that one. <laughs> uh, now this is the steamer, the Merrimack. This was the, really the best known river steamer and this was also built by Shaw. And it was actually built on Rings Island by uh, Lemuel Marquand. Um, and it, um, uh, it, was, it ran on the Merrimack for, for many years. But it, it was also, it was also um, quite large. Um, uh, it was 168 feet long. So it could carry plenty of people. Um, you can see that the, you know, the, 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 the jetties uh, 
kicked off uh, really rapid change. I should have mentioned that before when they were built. Um, because for the first time, um, people realized that, that the, the end of the, uh, both Plum Island and Salisbury Point would be stabilized. So um, you know, that made it much more you know, interesting and valuable as a, as a sort of investment property. And when the jetties were being built, the very couple, couple of years, um, Mr. Shaw, again, um, got control of the, of the majority interest in the Salisbury commoners. So he controlled the majority interest in, in the beach. Again, nothing had been sold yet. But when the, the commoners' uh, interests, an individual who had a, a share could sell his share, or he could pass it down in his will, uh, or, uh, uh, and you know, they could grant land if they wanted to, but they could also, these shares were transferable. And so Shaw picked up enough of the shares that he wound up having the controlling vote in the commoners. Um, so that essentially put him in control of the beach um, at that time. Um, and that, and because of that, um, you know, he built a new wharf. Um, he he bought um, he bought the Seaside Railroad. Um, he also uh, bought the Plum Island Turnpike at the same time. He bought the Plank Road, <laughs> uh, and he bought and he basically he developed um, uh, he he built a horse railroad from Salisbury Beach to the train station in Salisbury. Um, he bought a, uh, a streetcar manufacturing company in Newburyport. So he, and eventually he owned all of the streetcar lines from Haverhill to, to Amesbury to Salisbury to Newburyport, Plum Island, Salisbury Beach. He owned all of that. Um, and um, he also began to build hotels at Salisbury Beach. And he bought the hotel on Plum Island as well. So he was definitely investing in this new in this newly um, protected area. It's really quite amazing. Um, and there's, there's one of his hotels, you know, improved uh, by the t just shortly after the jetties were built. And he had a long, much longer pier. Um, these aren't great pictures, but there was, a, there was a restaurant there and a viewing platform. You know, he had, he had it all fixed up at that end of the beach. Um, another hotel. There's the Plank Road. He owns that too. But now, as you, this view is interesting because, as you can see, look at how many larger houses have been built and hotels. Salisbury Beach is tur really turning into something. Um, and we'll get closer to some of that in a minute. Jerry, yes? Is this the somebody else in area? I, I, I honestly don't know. I, the, he, was a, he was just a, re, a major entrepreneur, you know, locally. I, 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 there's no biography of him. I've gotten a few pieces, um, but uh, it's sort of, it, but that's, but any, anyway, uh, this is one of the first large hotels at the center. You see the Plank Road coming to the beach. That's the Atlantic House. Um, and the, and the, the toll booth you can see is to the right. Um, but again, everything is still, you know, coming uh, by horse or by boat. Uh, here's another view. This shows the Plank Road and the Old County Road going off in the other direction. Apparently, the, uh, the, the trolleys, the horse railroad, was, was not put on the Plank Road. Probably wouldn't hold it. I think we should hold questions. I'll answer things later, because I can't, I can't interact with you very well. Um, um, we can go, I'll be, we'll have plenty of time for questions later, and I can go back and look at different slides. Um, anyway, the, the railroads, the horse railroads went on the old county road, and the plank road was kept separate. Here's another view um, looking up the beach. That's uh, one of the hotels, the Neptune House. This is, this is still very early. This is in the uh, 1880s. Uh, and here's another one of Glenn Fowler's paintings. That shows you what the horse railroad looked like. I think that's wonderful. Uh, and th this is actually a picture from Salisbury Square. This is not from the beach, but it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the railroad, it's the, it's, the, it's the car to the beach. You recognize that house, don't you? That's the 
house of pizza. <laughs> that's, that's now the house of pizza. And this is very interesting. This, this shows you where uh, Glenn Fow uh, got, got, hit, made, got that picture. There is the original photograph that he painted from. It's accurate to the, um, it's accurate, really everybody is there. That can, except one conductor seems to be missing. The two horses, the men in the, in the, in the barn door, it's all the same. It's really quite neat. Um, so technology is continuing, and uh, the next thing that, uh, that Shaw did was he invested in a little steam engine that would take people from the river up to the center, and that was called the Ajax. It was called a, steamed, a, a, a dummy steam engine. And you can see the kind of sort of Victorian-looking seats uh, that uh, would haul lots of people uh, from the steamers up to the center. Uh, next technology, there's the steam engine pulling a car. And but then by 1891, they've electrified the, um, the horse cars turned into electric trolleys. And you can see, um, you can see the, uh, you know, run by electricity at that time. Uh, again, wide open. Um, now remember, there's no water system. There's a water tank. They had to have wells to serve everybody. Um, but these are all Fowler's uh, paintings. And this is, this is interesting. This is one of the mysteries that I have not been able to resolve. This is Cable Avenue. And that's the Cable House. That's a hotel. And there was also a Cable Stable. <laughs> but why was Cable Avenue called Cable? I can't... I, it was these, there was never anything that was drawn by, uh, by, uh, by a cable. There was never a, you know, a, a transmission cable. I just don't know. This is a very interesting, this is a big thing you know, from South Hope Chapel. This was a wonderful little place um, at the beach. And you can see here, that's on the way to, the, uh, to Black Rocks. Another view uh, from, by Glenn Fowler. But there's where it came from, postcard. And you can see they're beginning to have some amusements. That looks like something that's going around, you know, a precursor of a merry-go-round. And I don't know what's going on there, but a uh, few things to, do, to, to, to play with. And uh, now it's getting even bigger. Uh, you can see that's the, there's the flying horses in that building. And you can see what's happened. It's quite interesting now. Plank Road has gone back to Marsh at this time. This is late 1800s. I don't know the exact date. And the county road is built on, which is quite, I don't, I don't know much about how all that happened. But it's a, it is a quite a different difference. Getting bigger. There's the Star of the Sea Chapel in the distance. Uh, but, you know, it sure doesn't look like what we see today, does it? <laughs> Lots of hotels. Um, water well, right? Water well, yeah. Yeah, windmills to, pow to power a pump to get you your water. There was no water system. And here's a very interesting amusement. Uh, now, what you, do you get the picture there? This, this is a balloonist, and what they would do, they would get the crowd around a big bonfire on the beach, and the crowd would hold the balloon and catch the hot air. Okay, and when it caught enough hot air, this trapeze artist would grab the rope and fly up into the sky. And you see he's got a parachute hanging from his waist. That's a parachute. And then, it, well, pardon me? I wouldn't be surprised. But the, uh, unfortunately, I don't know how many successful flights they had. But one, in one of the flights, the guy got tangled up and he drowned. So, but you can imagine that would draw a crowd. 
<laughs> I don't think anyone does that anymore. Oops. This is the, this is a, the first great fire at Salisbury Beach in 1908. It did not burn the center, uh, but it burned south of the center, and it burned really a lot, as you can see. So that really changed the face of the beach. And this is, this is interesting. This is the ruins of the Hope Chapel. And this is Dr. Spaulding, who was the, a doctor. Well, the, the, you can see the, uh, the plaque on the wall. That's in, that's in his memory. Uh, he was, must have been a wonderful person. But the, the chapel burned, and there's the bell. Nothing left but the bell. And the, there's a very interesting story about the chapel and the bell which is that Dr. Spaulding bought the chapel and the bell from a small town in New Hampshire and uh, transported them down here. But the story of the bell is that during the Indian Wars, the Indians had stolen the bell. And they had run off with it. And the settlers tracked them down in the snow and recovered their bell. So this bell has been, been around. And today, it's on, this, on Salisbury Green. You can, that's the bell on the green. That's from Hope Chapel. Um, this is a, a little detour, but uh, one of the other things that's happening on the beaches was uh, the life-saving service. Uh, you know, there were lots of shipwrecks. These were long, dangerous coasts. And there was a life-saving station at Salisbury Beach and also one at Plum Island. And this is the one from Salisbury Beach. Big lookout tower. Uh, really quite a nice, beautiful building. Um, and there they are. You can see they're, they're taking their uh, boat, pulling it out with a horse. And you see their life, their life preserver is probably full of cork. Um, and they're going out. And they did a lot of practicing. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that they did was um, they, if a ship was stranded offshore and the storm was too big and they couldn't get to it, they could fire a cannon with a line. And then, uh, so what they're doing here is they're practicing. They're pretending that's a ship. And they're trying to shoot that line across the tree of a mast so that then people can secure it on the ship and come in via the line, via the, via the lifeline. And they had, this is called a breeches buoy. They would, that's a little, like a pair of breeches. A person on the ship could get in the breeches and then ride to shore. So that was what they were practicing. Sort of fun to see here in the background, though. Look, there's really, this was somewhat north on the, of the, on the beach. And you see, there's nothing up to the north. It's wide open. <coughs> One of the most famous wrecks uh, was the uh, wreck of the, of the Jenny Carter uh, in, in 1894. And this was a ship that was loaded with stone and got caught in a storm and wrecked right off the center of Salisbury Beach. Um, and the men, there were six people on board, and they abandoned ship, and they tried to swim to shore, and they all drowned. Uh, the the lifesavers couldn't get to them. And they all, by the time, you know, by the time they got to shore, they were dead all drowned. After the storm, the lifesavers went out, and they found the ship's cat sleeping next to a stove that was still lit. In other words, if they had stayed in their galley, they would have been fine. But the cat was fine, but they weren't. And that's, this, this still appears occasionally, but that's the Jenny Carter. And this is another uh, wreck. This is the last big, this was a, a fishing schooner that got caught in a storm. And there's an interesting story of this, the captain tried to sail south and get around Cape Ann in the storm, and he couldn't make it. And then he tried to tack back and get uh, past, um, uh, you know, go, go get out to the north, and he couldn't make it. He knew he was doomed. So what he did was he turned the ship, and he sailed right for the center of Salisbury Beach. And instead of trying to prevent himself from, from uh, being caught, he just full speed ahead, as far as he could get, and ran the boat almost onto the beach. And they said that the crew uh, practically stepped, uh, could, could just walk to shore. He drove it so far onto the beach and saved them all by doing that. 
This is a picture from Plum Island looking towards Salisbury Beach. And it's, it's sort of interesting to see how, the, you know, there's about you know, a large part of Plum Island that was completely undeveloped at that time. But on Salisbury Beach at the river, you can see all these houses. And there's a big tent city here. Again, remember, this land is um, still, you know, for a long time, is, is still, being, uh, still being leased. Uh, so people could, you know, rent tents, et cetera. There's the beachfront at the, at the river uh, in, in that era. You can see lots of nice houses, quite well developed. Uh, now we're getting to the next level of technology. This is, this is, this is, um, first cars coming to the beach. What happened was that the county took over the Plank Road and uh, made a permanent road there and, put, and the trolleys went along that. So that became Beach Road. Uh, I don't really know yet the date. It must have been around 1905. I think that uh, Mr. Shaw was behind this as well because by that time he was the treasurer of the Commonwealth. And they took over, also took over the, the uh, Plum Island Turnpike and improved it and made it a public road. So I have a feeling that he might have had a hand behind a lot of that. I don't have, I haven't really researched that yet. But it made it much easier to go. You can see there's a, ho here's a horse and, and buggy, but there's also these early cars. And look how developed the beach has become. Look at that wonderful roller coaster. And there's the Hotel Edwards. See that? It's sort of, so you can really see some of the, thi and so, some of the things that, uh, this is around, this is somewhere around uh, 1905 or so. Um, um, and at this time, Shaw again made a deal. Um, in 1903, he um, bought all of the interests of the commoners out, the, the rest of the people who had interests. He bought them all out. Then he got the town meeting in Salisbury to sell all the interest the town had at the beach. The be town had a school and some various other things. Uh, and some land had gone to the town at some times over the centuries. So the town sold Shaw, sold, I'm sorry, sold the commoners, which he controlled, all of its interest on the beach, except the ways to the, oh, to the beach, um, for $11,000. And then the commoners sold all of the beach to Shaw. So at that point, he owned the whole beach um, and didn't have any minority interests. Um, so he was in complete control. And then, and he continued then to invest. Um, he, he built this, this is the Hotel Cushing. He built that. Uh, remember, he, he controls all of the, <laughs> he controls most of the steamers and all the trolleys. Um, and there's, you can see the trolleys are getting a little fancier. Uh, and there's the Cushing Hotel. This was called Cushing Avenue. This is now, you know, we, um, the center of the beach. Uh, it was named after Caleb Cushing, who was a, uh, a local politician who became governor. And there's the Hotel Newark, which Shaw built with his partners. And this was very fancy. He had great aspirations. You know, now that he owned the beach, he invested. This was a magnificent hotel. It had 300 electric light bulbs. And it had, its, you know, remember, there was no electric system. It had, they, these hotels had to have their own dynamos to produce their own electricity. And so this, and it had hot and cold running water. It was very fancy. And uh, I've seen some of the menus. They were very fancy, too. So it was a very big deal. Uh, and look at that crowd. I think it's great. Here's his house. He built a big house there. It's still there. And these are some wonderful gazebos to go sit on the beach. I think that it's fun to see the two different ones side by side. This is right at the center. Could one be a van platform? I, I, well, that, I would think probably so. I don't, uh, maybe someone's just playing there. I don't know. Good question. People at the beach. You can see this is a pretty good picture. It shows you one thing. Very interesting to see how wide the beach is. Lots of sand. Look at that. 
We don't have that much sand anymore. <laughs> Good beach scenes. There's a nice street scene. Um, this is a theater called the Bijou, and this is a this is called the New Dance Hall. This is the trolley waiting station, where the trolley from the um, uh, river met the trolleys from up and down the beach. Um, and this is the Hotel Cushing over here. This is, um, this is the Flying Horses. This is another dance hall. There's lots of activities. Another dance hall. Amusements. What would the SPCA say about this? <laughs> <laughs> How did they ever get that horse to do that? <laughs> and here, this is, I think this is the classic. This is the entrance to the roller coaster. And it was called the Spiral Safety Thriller. They, safety is small. But, <laughs> but look, here's Willie's. Notice that? Still there. And there's another view. This is the spiral safety thriller. And the thing in the back is a tremendous rotating swing called, that was called the Urban of Philadelphia. And you'd get in that, and you couldn't imagine how, how far out you would swing. That was definitely a thrill. And this is very funny. This, is, this says um, duck hoops. Uh, this is the only live game on the beach. And I guess, it, I guess people were throwing hoops on ducks who were ducking their heads. And if you were successful, you won a prize. That was an early, <laughs> an early amusement, the only live game on the beach. I thought that's fun. Uh, but it wasn't to last. And this is the Great Fire of 1913. And that's the post office burning. And there goes the Newark Hotel. And look, this is very interesting. Bathing suits to let. <laughs> I like that. They were that devastating fire. Oh, next day. It, it, this fire destroyed 125 buildings in one day. It just leveled everything. And there's the Urban still standing. Part of the um, roller coaster is up and parts down, but everything else is gone. Look at that, just devastation. And this is the site of those two hotels. In the foreground is the Cushing, and in the background is the Newark, and all that's left is their dynamos. You see that round thing? That was their generating plant. That's all that's left standing of those big hotels. Remnants of the Hotel Cushing, not much. But in three years, back in business. The Ocean Echo was built, but you know, right away, everyone rebuilt, and the crowds were thronging back there. Isn't that something? Talk about resilience, to be able to come back from a fire like that. Um, I don't think there was any government assistance either, you know. And so that's it. That, that brings us to the end. And I, you know, I, I, these came from many places. The Salisbury Point Railroad Historical Society has a railroad collection. The public library has a lot of good materials. Steve Atherton has contributed a lot of things. Alan White, a friend on Plum Island, has a big postcard collection. Historical Society has lots of wonderful things. Larry Eaton's a postcard collector, and he gave me some pictures. Army Corps of Engineers for maps. The town of Salisbury for the wonderful Glenn Fowler paintings. Uh, Larry Medeiros, who is a friend in Salisbury, who has some wonderful things. Gerard Witten, who gave me some maps and pictures. And the Seashore Trolley Museum also has a lot of trolley things. So I went all over the place to collect this. Uh, Thank <laughs> you.
So I'd, I'd be glad to, um, I know you have a lot of questions, but uh, yes. I have a microphone. And it was a microphone. If people want to ask questions, I'd be happy to answer. Maybe we could turn the lights up a little. I don't know how to do that. Right there, right behind the coat tree. Oops, OK. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah, ask, go ahead. They weren't. Okay. I see. And but how did the town get the paintings? As part of a program, he was paid by CETA. Well, that's not what Bill told me. That's very interesting. Uh, let me. I will, I will. Um, I'll, I'll just give this to people. Did I, I just to, so people get the whole picture, um, Glenn Fowler apparently worked for a CETA, pro, you know, federally funded program and was painting historical things. And that was coming through the town. So the town wound up with the pictures that way. I, I, I was told otherwise. So I'm glad to learn that. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's why I'm here. I, there's so much to learn. I appreciate that. Um, anybody else? Chris? It'd be good if you just pass this around, because then people can hear right away. It, it looks like in 1908, the, there was a significant fire at the Beach Center, and then in 1913. Was there anything after that? I know your presentation only went up to 1916, but I was there anything significant that, you know, uh, impacted the beach. I think the ocean echo burned in 1920. I didn't like, there's a lot of fires. Actually, there was a lot of suspicious fires. There were fires, the Plum Island Bridge burned in 1913. There was a big fire on Plum Island in 1913. Uh, there might have, there was a, at least one big fire in Newburyport. There may have been a fire bug. They, they, may, <laughs> they, may, have, they may have changed building codes and maybe fire protection methods. I don't know. That may have I don't know. Like, Oh, well, you know, one thing I did before, which was fun, is I have a history of how Plum Island took its present shape. I did that on Plum Island, but I could do that here, too. It's really quite fun. Um, be happy to do that sometime. But at this point, I've got, yeah, I do have a lot of leftovers, but, um, you know, I haven't, haven't thought that far ahead yet. <laughs> what happened to Edward Shaw? After the fires, did he lose his fortune? No, uh, I'm, I'm very good question, and I should have said this. Mr. Shaw was either very lucky or very smart. He sold out in 1911. Wow. In everything. Wow. <laughs> He's a fire I don't know. <laughs> He sold his, he even sold his, he sold out to the Salisbury Beach Associates, which we all know, right? So he was the original owner. Then he, whatever he owned, he sold to them, including the house. And so they took it from there. And that's when people began to be able to buy land. Salisbury Beach Associates was formed to start selling land. Shaw had not sold it. So he, he gave them the whole package, and then they began to break it up. And uh, it's, it's sort of interesting because... You know, uh, one, of the, one of the aspects of the Salisbury Beach Associates is that, um, for example, there's a trolley track up uh, North End Boulevard, which um, the typical arrangement was either to lease or to sell land to somebody and, or, or, or give a long-term lease, which, um, of course, when the lease is over, it stays in the owner's hands, right? So when Salisbury Beach developed to the north, the main way of getting back and forth was the trolley. So everybody's frontage was from the trolley line toward the beach. Well, when the road was built, it was built on the other side to the west of the trolley line. And then when the trolley disappeared, the beach associates owned that long strip between everyone's house and the road. And that's been a source of a lot of upset over, over the years for people. So 
Um, there's a lot of interesting remnants like that, which are, you know, a product of this. Um, any other questions? Kevin? Yeah. yeah, I want to thank you for uh, uh, filling in the puzzle why there was so much uh, cinders and black uh, burnt <laughs> wood and stuff when I was doing the work on my house and the foundation, digging it. It was, it was unbelievable. All the little burnt, like campfire stuff. It looked like campfires. I didn't know what it was. I think that area burned over yeah. at least twice. Yeah, it was, it's, it was unbelievable. The sand was so black working in it, it just got you all, all Isn't that all something? Dirty. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. The or Cushing, I, you know, I don't know. It was called Cushing, uh, Cushing Square. It was the Cushing Post Office. Caleb Cushing was a, a governor and a big politician from this area, but I don't have the exact date of that. It did, it was Cushing Post Office, right. Right, right. Yeah, we saw that burning up. Oh, was there? The lady says there was another fire in 1944. We should we should give you the um, we should give you the microphone. Who's got it? Well, no, but see, people at home can't hear you, so that's that's the problem. I think people are watching. Well, I um, I hope this was met your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, fun. Huh? Yeah, I love this. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a great job. You must be very good.